Theropods are a group that have long incited fear in both the animals that actually encountered them and those that watch them today. And part of that is the perceived reptilian and seemingly alien nature of them. Because feathers can't be all that scary. Right? Should we just also pretend that that's referring to the 30k subscribers rather than my new age? Back in 2012, a fossil dealer came forward with a very strange set of fossils indeed. Cut into pieces for ease of transport were three nearly complete theropods found in Liaoning province of China. From these specimens, a new genus and species was named by Zhu Xiang et al. in 2012, Utyrana Swali. Utyranus was a relatively large theropod, with the largest and only adult specimen given size estimations of around 9 meters or 29.5 feet long and around 1.4 tons in weight. Now despite the name and somewhat close relationship as a Tyrannosauroid, Eutyranus showed quite a few key differences to the famous T-Rex, and not just in size. This guy actually showed more superficial resemblance to various Allosauroids, with longer three-clawed forelimbs and a laterally thinner skull complete with a crest that ran along the top of the skull. Then there is of course the namesake of the animal itself. Utyranosuali actually translates roughly to beautifully feathered tyrant, owing to the distinctively clear integument impressions that were preserved on these specimens. And from this, along with the title, you may have already guessed that this guy had a rich plumage that was fossilized in incredible detail. Covering this big boy was a thick coat of filamentous feathers, which are very similar to the fluff seen on most bird chicks. Now the exact nature of these feathers in terms of morphology could not be established due to the quality of this preservation. So we're actually unsure if this would have been fine fuzz, shaggy fur, a coarse coat, or something in between. Either way, these feathers in life would have been around 6 to 8 inches long across the whole body. So if we treat the word as informal and forget the connotation of mammalian hair, Eutyranus was undoubtedly furry. Now, Eutyrannus is the current record holder for the largest dinosaur with direct evidence of feathers. But despite this and the name, it is thought that Eutyrannus wasn't actually that special for this integument. As far as we can tell, T Rex was actually more or less scaly. But that guy is actually a very poor representative for Tyrannosauroids as a whole. Most members of this group were actually more similar to Eutyrannus, being not only likely feathery, but also three fingered and overall more gracile with varying types of head crests. In fact, Juvenile Tyrannosaurus is probably a better representation of this group. Speaking of... It's not often that we get an insight into the ontogeny of a dinosaur, which is the change in an animal's morphology as it ages. So to get such rich insights from the first specimens discovered is practically unheard of. Where Eutyrannus did resemble T-Rex was in this regard, having relatively long and slender lower hind limbs and forelimbs, which lengthened at a much slower rate than the rest of the body as well as having a much more narrow and slender skull as a juvenile. But before we take a look at what Malicious Macklemore was actually like in life, we should first take a look at where it lived. Now it wasn't officially documented where exactly Eutyrannus was found, with the original location of the specimens being anecdotal, but it is likely that they were found in rocks pertaining to the famous Yuzian Formation. This would make the time that Eutyrannus lived at approximately 125 million years ago, during the early Cretaceous. During this time, China varied in a similar fashion to today. Despite being the time of the Mesozoic greenhouse, China was actually much colder than once thought, counteracting the warmer global temperatures with a higher latitude than it has today. With humid summers and unusually frigid arid winters, China's average annual temperature would have been around 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Around this area specifically were a series of freshwater lakes, which supported various invertebrates, fish and turtles, along with rich surrounding flora. And walking around on land was a very famous suite of dinosaurs. The Yuzian Formation represents the second of three faunal phases of the J-hole biota, an early Cretaceous ecosystem that has preserved some of the best Mesozoic specimens the world has ever seen. Now the Yuzian Formation is characterized geologically by the abundant freshwater lakes that made up the area that was surrounded by wet temperate rainforests, as well as volcanic activity which, when mixed with the abundant lakes, meant that noxious gases were released via limnic eruptions. These are essentially when a cloud of CO2 erupts from a lake due to volcanic activity, asphyxiating and killing any organism it encompasses. 
This not only helps explain the high turnover rate of fauna that we see, but also can potentially contribute to the exceptional preservation since there were less animals that could survive long enough in these areas to actually scavenge. Living alongside Uteranus were various invertebrates, from arachnids, wasps and beetles to various crustaceans, as well as freshwater fish, amphibians such as early frogs, freshwater reptiles like turtles and charistoderans, and various lizards. A few basal mammals lived here as well, such as Yanoconodon, J. Holodens, Gobiconodon, Eomaya, and the dinosaur-eating Rapanomammus, which I talk more about here. Up in the skies were pterosaurs such as Hyopterus, Meganopterus, Inchengopterus, Gladocephaloideus, and Phalongus. And when we look at the dominant fauna back in the ground, we of course see those dinosaurs. Sauropods from here include Liaoninga Titan, Dongbei Titan, and Rusinia, as well as Ceratopsians like Liaoceratops and Cetacosaurus, which I also talk about here. And we also see ornithopods like Bolong, Jeholosaurus, Jinxiaosaurus, and Changnyania, along with the adorable ankylosaur, Liaoningosaurus. Theropods living alongside Eutyrannus include various avialans like Confucianus, Archaeorhynchus, Liaozionus, Yizianosaurus, Shenwainiao, and Liaoningornus, alongside some compsognathids such as Sinocalyopteryx and the famous Sinosauropteryx, and many dromaeosaurs and troodonts, like Sinornophosaurus, Tianuraptor, Gracilaraptor, Zhongxianosaurus, Sinovinator, Mai, Dalianosaurus, and Sinusinasus. We also see herbivorous theropods like Shenzhousaurus, Baipiaosaurus, and Jianchangosaurus, as well as omnivores like Caudipteryx and Incisivosaurus. When we're talking big boy theropods alongside Eutyrannus, we used to see Dilon, Raptor Rex, and some yet to be named Carnosaur. Apologies if I butchered any of that pronunciation. Okay, so that's the environment, but what about the actual role that Eutyrannus played here? Again, it's difficult to say considering that most of the information that we have is anecdotal, but there are a few hints. The easy information is one that spans quite a few million years, and considering we don't know exactly where Eutyrannus was found within this, we can't actually say for sure what it coexisted with, and what kind of role it would have played in this environment. Now considering the plumage, other fauna, and the overall climate, it's pretty easy to think of Eutyrannus as the kind of grizzly bear of the Mesozoic. But let's not forget that these were found as a group, supposedly. If we can surmise what this implies, it means that Eutyrannus hunted in family groups. And when a predator hunts in packs, it normally means that they're eating something much bigger than any one individual. Now the only herbivores that were bigger than Eutyrannus from this formation were sauropods. Individuals of Dongbei Titan have been found with feeding traces from some sort of large theropod, but this hasn't been shown as definitely from Eutyrannus. Nonetheless, if this group were hunting together, there is no doubt that Eutyrannus definitely chow down once in a while on our friendly long neck giants. Can you see such a cuddly deaf chicken taking down a giant, Mo? Let me know down below whilst I answer today's questions, the first of which comes from Michael Caden6973, who has asked Your Beriella Pelter video is my favourite video that you made. Thanks. Uh, and the idea of a mummified dinosaur that still has preserved skin and colour pigments is very interesting and makes us know so much more about dinosaurs. So here is my question. What is a dinosaur that you would want discovered in which it is preserved as mummified, uh, i.e. preserved skin slash tissue, colour pigments and other details? Ooh, I mean... Any dinosaur would be good for me. If I had to choose one though, I would say that I would love to see either a Spinosaurus, namely the spine itself, as I'm curious to know if it played a role in display, Triceratops for the same reason with that frill, or my favourite Dromaeosaur, Utahraptor. Again though, any dinosaur to come out with this incredible level of preservation would be a win for me, so fingers crossed. Uh, our next one comes from Tomek Kazorski, which I hope I said that a little bit better than last time. Uh, 9689. How does the wing membranes of pterosaurs work? I know that the wing can be subdivided into different sections that have different properties, but how does that culminate together into flight? 
thank you and good day. You have a nice day as well. Okay, so I did go into detail about the wing membranes of pterosaurs in the video that I did on the group here, but I'll briefly touch on it now again. I'm also not sure by subdivisions whether or not you mean the layers within the membrane or the different sections across the body, so I'll just cover both. Basically, the skin membrane of a pterosaur's wing is much more than just a flap of skin and is subdivided into three distinct layers that are crisscrossing special fibres called actinofibrils. Now, the use is debated, but it's thought that these could be stiffened or relaxed using thin muscles that also ran through the membrane to adjust the wing as and when it was needed. In terms of the different sections, you had the propatagium, which attached from the wrist to the shoulder and acted as a leading edge in flight, pushing airflow up and over the animal. A brachiopatagium, forming the biggest part of the wing that went from the torso to the elongated fourth finger, which is what did the flapping, and the cruropatagium, which connected between the legs and helped with steering. As always, I hope those answers helped as much as I hope that you've enjoyed this video enough to consider subscribing if you haven't already, so that I can catch you guys next time.